Thank you very much. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Angeliki, and today I am very excited to uh, welcome and introduce four exceptional uh, speakers uh, with whom we will be discussing a topic that has definitely touched all of us during the past year. Um, and that has to do, of course, with the post-pandemic workplace and the future of work. Uh, here to discuss and offer their valuable insights are um, Ms. Andrea Hendricks, uh, Country Head of Infosys Germany, welcome. Uh, Ms. Molly Nagler, Chief Learning Officer of PepsiCo, welcome. Uh, Ms. Hiltrud Werner, Member of the Board of Management, Integrity and Legal Affairs uh, of Volkswagen, welcome. And last but not least, Ms. Judith Wiese, Chief Human Resources Officer and member of the Managing Board of Siemens. Welcome. Uh, before we start, I would also like to take the opportunity and mention that the audience can put their questions in the Q&A chat as we are having this discussion. Um, and we will get to some of the, the questions towards the end of our uh, discussion together. So in order to kick off uh, our discussion, uh, let's start with unpacking the concept of future of work. It's, it's a concept that we have increasingly been hearing about, especially as we are trying to make sense of what has been the impact of the global pandemic in the way we work and organize ourselves. Um, so Judith, as the CHRO of Siemens, an industrial manufacturing company, how do you see the future of, of work? Yeah, thank you, Angeliki, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, glad to be here on the panel today. Um, now, I think that the future of work probably has, has long arrived. Um, and what we see is that digitalization in particular has first disrupted our lives as, as consumers and then has increased or changed the expectations that I think people have of the workplace. And that was even before the pandemic, because people, I think, have an expectation of working differently in a way that is much more personalized to their needs, that's much more convenient as they would know as consumers. Um, and therefore they also want more autonomy and, and flexibility. And that was all there pre-pandemic. I think the pandemic itself then has, has accelerated some of the um, development in terms of how we work. So the, the how of work is, is clearly one area. The other is what we work. Um, and so we, we always talk about the, the how and the, the new ways of working, but also what is going to be the new work. And I think as an employer, we have um, a great obligation and a great interest as well as a business to try and look ahead as much as we can in terms of changing skill sets. But as employees, our people also have both an expectation, but I think also need to take a lot of ownership in making sure that upskilling and reskilling is something that is actually a skill, a muscle that they train and use for the rest of their lives. Because we think uh, we, will, we will be disrupted on, a, on an ever increasing pace as we go forward. Perfect. Thank you so much for your comments. And, and how uh, is uh, the future of work, if any, uh, different for Volkswagen, uh, Hiltrud? Well, yes, uh, when we talk about uh, new work and new normal, then I think what the pandemic also teached us was to look what what was wrong in the old normal, yeah? Was it, was it really necessary to fly around the world for a half day meeting or, or has there been um, the necessity to commute uh, long distances to work every day? So, so I think um, Volkswagen before the pandemic already had a lot of um, good tools in place to, um, to work from home, part-time um, uh, home office uh, solutions, et cetera. But now I think we have to rethink a lot of that uh, again and also to make the best use of those days where people are at their offices. So um, office spaces um, probably need a little uh, redesign in this case so that when half of the offices are empty also that probably you need less walls and 
and other stuff. So I, I think um, it is important in this phase that uh, we also understand that when the pandemic started, um, we had no option but uh, to like the tools that were available. We had the necessity to, to like Zoom and uh, Skype and whatever. But now when people see that um, working from home is, is an option, I think also the, the digital industry will come up with far more um, uh, innovations in this field than we can imagine. May it be augmented reality for your office or whatever. So, so we will not sit in Zoom meetings in two years if there's another pandemic, I'm sure of that. Fascinating insights. And Andrea, has, has the experience and the, and the view of the future of work, uh, is, it, is it the same or different uh, for Infosys? It is. It was a similar experience, but maybe slightly different. So first of all, yes, we used our time there. So thank you, uh, Ms. Rana, for mentioning this to remodel the Frankfurt office. But looking at the future, um, there is not only one future. So when we start looking at the nearest future, right, most employees are absolutely fed up with working from home right now. They um, miss the office, the experience of jointly working together in the same room. And on the other hand, we start noticing social anxiety that might have developed in some employees over the last 15 months, um, living in isolation for so long, which surely we will need to take into account. And so what I foresee is a stage return to office, a hybrid model going forward based on the needs of clients, projects, and company demands. Now work in the year 2030, let alone 2050, will again look completely different from what we know today, right? Um, that might be an interesting topic though for, for another day, um, as by then the nature of work will have completely changed due to the constantly evolving and progressing automation. We're talking, yes, augmented reality that was just mentioned, virtual reality, we're talking neuromorphic computing, and all of that in return will have to result also in new ways of schooling and new university curriculums. So the ESMT will have to be working on that as well. So all of you have given us some snippets of how the future of work might look like. And, and Molly, I think that uh, leads us to the question of whether are we going back to normal or is this indeed a new normal and what would it look like? Um, thank you so much. So as, as my um, esteemed co-panelists have said, you know, the, the need for flexibility, the desire for um, more autonomy in how we structure our work days pre-existed um, the pandemic. And now um, I think we've all shifted our mindset in ways that we're gonna enable that. So in the US, our offices will reopen July 6th um, and internationally, it'll just depend on you know, what, how things are going with the pandemic. Um, and we're, we're moving to um, a hybrid environment where your time in the office should be structured around the activities and um, what you need to get done that day, your role, uh, what your team needs. So we have a four-part framework called the four C's. It's create, connect, collaborate, and celebrate. And if that's on your agenda for the day, then um, think about coming into the office. And if that's not on your agenda, then you should feel free to work remotely. Um, so I think it's a really nice um, structure where it's not dogmatic at all about, you know, you need to be in two days or three days or zero days, but um, gives people flexibility within a framework. Perfect. So we have been discussing about all these flexible and hybrid modes of, of working. And I was wondering, how would you uh, suggest that we can support leaders and managers uh, in this transition uh, into uh, these uh, ways of working? Um, what are the challenges uh, behind that? Um, uh, you did? Yeah, we think that tone from the top is really important, um, mm -hmm. first of all, to say what kind of culture is actually needed um, in this famous new normal. What does it take uh, to work successfully? And um, a bit like Hilter said before, some of the things you know we had to learn, whether we liked it or not, uh, during the pandemic. And one of them is to trust our people that they will do a great job, even if we don't see them in the office. And that is definitely something that we want to uphold, um, making sure that our people feel trusted, that outcomes matter, and not time in the office, time and presence. 
Um, and that people really, as, as you said, Molly, are very conscious about you know, what they come in for and what, what they want to connect on and where they're actually more productive elsewhere. We want to give that flexibility, but that also is a journey for our managers. And now we're baking um, into every single leadership curriculum that we have. We now, we now bake in the ideas that are needed, the concepts that are needed, and the belief system. And of course, during the pandemic, we've already given people um, help and support in terms of how to, how to stay connected. What we're now doing specifically for the return, and we haven't set a, a date yet like PepsiCo has, but um, because it's so different around the world. But um, we are now asking all our teams to come together, uh, line manager with our teams to think about what it is they want to organize for coming back. What are some of the rituals they want to engage in? What are the things that they really want to be in person for? And where can they actually very nicely virtually connect, particularly interesting for international teams. Now, the thing, and I'd, I'd be interested how my colleagues see this, that the thing that I think is going to be um, most to be watched is how we do hybrid, because today, being remote for everybody as has actually created a different level of, of inclusion, of inclusiveness. Um, and that goes for, you know, headquarter versus uh, region or countries, as much as it goes for, for gender diversity, um, where people have typically um, had different work patterns already before. And we know it is really important, particularly when we talk diversity and inclusion, that everybody is visible, everybody has similar opportunities. And I think this is one to watch in, in the kind of new hybrid world that this doesn't fall off the, the cracks or fall through the cracks. Thank you. Uh, and um, particularly on, uh, on the point of uh, diversity and managing these new ways of working. Um, and Molly, how would you say that we would be able to support um, employees in, in this transitioning phases? Uh, working remotely, uh, who was able to benefit from those practices? And what are the changes now that we are uh, progressively coming back to the office? Yes, I mean, as Judith said, it's going to be so important to manage these hybrid meetings where some people are remote and some are in person and not ignore the people who are remote. Um, I saw an interesting report by Microsoft recently that suggests appointing a moderator for every meeting and this role can rotate who is the advocate for the people who are on screen, and making sure that their voices are heard and that they're, they weigh in. Um, at PepsiCo, we also use um, some practices uh, for like agile teams that include rounds. So in a meeting, it's just a technique where you go person by person and ask for their input rather than just assuming that everyone agrees with like the most vocal person who has chimed in. Um, we're running an online uh, live program right now called Being Visible Virtually to help people with their you know, personal brands, with networking, with team building, in an online environment. Um, we've also given toolkits to managers for planning their in-office and hybrid time with their team. So everyone knows what to expect. And you know, when you're coaching your kids' baseball team, that you know, everyone's aware of that commitment and that you know, you're not going to be in, that, in the office at that moment. Um, so just emphasizing transparency, flexibility, um, and predictability in schedules is important. Thank you. And we discussed a little bit about um, the change in, in culture that organizations now are facing uh, due to um, this abrupt disruption. Um, so, uh, Hiltrud, I would uh, like to um, ask you, how has um, digital transformation on all these disruptions uh, impacted the, the culture of uh, Volkswagen? Well, first, first of all, uh, I think most of us would agree that uh, the, uh, the culture how we work uh, has turned out not to be a luxury uh, in, in, the, in the pandemic. So we have, we have really seen that um, uh, following um, rules and regulations and, and keeping, keeping uh, compliance and integrity at a high level, is very very important, and I really liked uh, the 
comment about trusting the employees. I mean, a lot of managers have seen that even in the fully new setup, the work was done. Uh, the work got done, so, so trust was important. But my, my point really is uh, also to, to, to look um, to, to those managers uh, that are responsible of uh, departments that cannot work from home. Uh, the majority of our workforce is at the production line. You know, you cannot assemble a car from home. So uh, making sure that everyone in the company feels uh, a constant flow of communication, feels that the company cares, that, that health and safety is the number one priority for each and every one, even those that have no home office opportunity. I, I think that was very important. And I mean, uh, at the car production, we have so many parameters and and decades of um, um, efficiency um, going into the production process. Now there came a new parameter, yeah? uh, safety, um, a distance of one and a half meters, uh, classifying all the workplaces into yellow and red and green. So where, where do we have the, the highest risk? How do we cope with that? How do uh, we help the management in these areas um, to, to motivate the workforce and also making sure that the workforce is not divided between those that have um, the luxury, as some say, to work from home, although some don't feel it as a luxury to have homeschooling and home office and other things to cope with at the same time. So this, this was really important and I think the communication and uh, as earlier mentioned, the tone from the top, that was very important and that is something we really have to keep up uh, to, to make everyone in the company being part of the family and, uh, and feeling that the same care applies to everyone. And is the experience the same, Andrea, uh, uh, in your own organization in terms of the of the need for um, a culture change or um, how culture can support these new ways of working? Oh, clearly. Um, so, so with with culture with culture itself, um, there it evolved around the COVID situation. Now in IT, not everybody was able to work from home, right? So um, some had to maintain server rooms, physical data centers, for example, they require on-site presence. But across the IT sector, we were very well equipped to work remotely. Um, so Emphasis Europe, for example, within a few days, we had 98% of all our employees working from home, a big difference, like for example, to, to Volkswagen where they're assembling cars and they have to be on-site. Um, so the needed technical infrastructure from hardware, I mean, like laptops to VPN tunnels, everything was already in place before the pandemic. And um, in addition, most employees in the IT industry had already previously logged in from home. So there was no specific training needs um, that were needed, uh, uh, trainings that needed to make this work from home and remote work possible. What was needed though, and that was high, with highest priority, was to align with the customers, with end users, with partners, to assure smooth delivery of services. That um, needed a getting together and took a lot of flexibility on both sides. A mindset change combined with a willingness to give remote work a chance. Um, and like we said earlier, we didn't really have a choice here, but still the mindset change was, was needed. And not only for employees, but also for employers alike. And um, that demanded that with the next priority, of course, a new framework, uh, combining rules and trust, ensuring data security, and for sure, developing also new managerial skills on top of new self-discipline, which needed to be acquired. So employers, independent of the sector, I think, um, felt the need to give advice on healthy and balanced living, reminding employees not to neglect fitness, um, to take regular breaks, and not just you know, sit in front of the monitor all day long. And um, the world of IT had another problem, a good one to have on top of that. And, and that was a part of the first dip, an overproportional rise in demand. Customers feeling the need and the pressure to modernize their IT landscapes, moving into the cloud automation, new solutions, transformation. So the COVID pandemic really was a clear power booster for the IT industry. Thank you. And, and you all mentioned 
somehow that uh, little pieces of, of this transformation were already there. Uh, and then the, the pandemic acted as a, as a catalyst for, for this change. And I was wondering um, what your views are on, on the role of learning and education in this uh, future of work. Um, so uh, Judith, um, how would you say that companies can, can provide the, the tools and the training um, in order to support these new ways of working? Yeah, I think, uh, I think like many, many others, uh, Siemens had long started already to put more of their training offering in the virtual space into the virtual classroom. And again, the pandemic has obviously accelerated that and has nicely accelerated adoption rates as well by, by our people. Um, we have implemented already a while ago, a platform, a learning platform by which we put our offerings on, but also from external providers so that our people can by now choose from about 100,000 different virtual learning units. So our task is actually more to navigate or help them navigate the offering to find out what is what is actually relevant for them going forward. And, uh, and so when we look at lifelong learning and the future of work and upskilling and reskilling, I think it's really important, again, that, that we give our best guidance on what we think is going to be relevant going forward. And we work with a methodology that we've developed um, to help the businesses find out at organizational level what we need, but then really break that down into job families, job profiles, so that we can then help our people to find the relevant path. And for some, that will be evolutionary upskilling. For some, it will be far more revolutionary reskilling. And we've done a, a few first pilots. And what we see is that for about 50% of our manufacturing population or plant-based population, it is it is more of a more of a substantial um, upskilling. But about uh, a quarter will be more heavily disrupted in terms of reskilling needs. So the muscle of, of learning is going to be extremely important. And maybe one last thought on this. I think there's a, there's a combination of forces at work. One is the shelf life of knowledge, um, you know, which the closer you get to IT and technology is decreasing heavily uh, and very quickly. And for countries like, like Germany, but other parts of the developed world as well, the demographic change kicks in at the same time. So we're losing or will be losing in the next 10 to 15 years substantial amount of our workforce. So the idea of what you don't build, you simply go to the market and buy, might very quickly be challenged in certain geographies. Thank you. And, and so far, we have also discussed about the need for agility, resilience, and, and skills that are evolving around those concepts. Um, Molly, do you think that these are skills that can be taught and learned? And, and if so, how? Um, yes, absolutely. So the rise of well-being and um, you know, serving the whole person at work, bringing your whole self to work is also, I think, predated the pandemic, but has been accelerated by the pandemic. Um, just the idea of authenticity emerged into the leadership uh, development arena um, long ago and has taken on a new meaning when you have you know, dogs and children and other things um, in the background and you're really getting a glimpse into people's um, life, you know, during, during a meeting. So um, we have, we also have a, um, a learner experience platform, um, much like Siemens that we launched during the pandemic. It's AI and machine learning powered. Um, it's a, just this candy store of lots of different learning resources from podcasts to videos um, and everything, and, you know, full-blown courses and everything in between. And many of those resources are devoted to well-being. Um, our learning community creates pathways. One of them we have is called Overwhelmed, which helps employees um, understand what they're feeling, what they're going through, and then how to ask managers for help. And then, of course, there are lots of manager tools as well. Um, we have lots of benefits for employees, um, you know, from just you know mindfulness apps and and everything like that. So, I think that trend is going to be here to stay. For quite a while and learning um, has a big role in it because we want to help people understand that these are learned skills and that you can get better at managing your time at advocating for your own needs 
at working with your manager on um, prioritizing and time management. Thank you. Um, and as we are hopefully uh, reaching towards an end of what seems to be the first part of this uh, global pandemic, um, if in, in a nutshell, uh, you would have the opportunity to keep something good that happened during the pandemic and to also dismiss something that was really, really um, a challenge and a barrier, um, what would that be, uh, Hiltrud? To the first part of your question, I, I think the uh, the communication that has improved uh, in the last 15 months, um, including the tone from the top, from uh, also uh, apps for our employees um, to, to stay tuned with the company, I think that's something we should uh, um, keep going with. Uh, it was a really good tool and it will also help us, as I said earlier, to um, uh, not to um, divide the workforce between those that have to work uh, from home and those that cannot do that. Um, the second point really is uh, that, yes, we all had to be very good in crisis management, uh, but now is the time to uh, think, what have you learned in crisis management in order to get better in crisis prevention? So, so I'm sure we are not the only company that currently works on uh, business continuity management programs, um, uh, does root cause analysis, um, uh, revisits the supplier network and how, how we can help them also to improve um, the, let's say, the fragility of the supplier network was uh, clearly visible also in the, in the global shutdown. And um, and I mean, we as a as a big company, we could easily develop uh, a good 100 point plan uh, uh, to make our production safe and sharing that with our suppliers in uh, order to help them that did not have the resources uh, to make their um, uh, production also um, uh, better in in times of pandemic. I think that was a good learning to see. Uh, what you should share, where we have a joint responsibility, and um, and it clearly helped um, also to to re-emphasize how critical uh, a good network is uh, for our product. Thank you so much for your answer. And before we take uh, questions from the audience, uh, Andrea, I would like to ask you the same question: What would you keep? What would you lose? What would I keep? What would I lose? Um, well, first of all, I'd like to keep the learn the, the lessons learned that we have from this, which is um, the agility and the resilience. And if you're wondering, you know, um, it, if people feel overwhelmed, yes, but learnability can be taught, and you know, um, agility can be can be learned. So this lockdown, you know, it put us all to a test, uh, individuals as well as organizations as a whole. And it was like learning to swim kind of in cold water, not exactly a scenario any one of us would have chosen, but um, we learned and we came out stronger. And this additional strength is something we have to keep, right? And it's also looking forward into remodeling structures and, and embedding trust into the new way forward. That's what we need to keep by all, by all means. What do we need to lose? I think you've, you've all seen it. You look around it, you look around and we're all humans, you know, we all depend on social interaction. Uh, we're social beings. How important the exchange is with others. And that's something that can be learned from the pandemic. Uh, we need to lose the loneliness. Couldn't agree more. Uh, so let's take the first question from the audience. Um, uh, it says, if you look at small and mid-sized companies, um, they struggle to invest in home office. So how should these companies understand hybrid? And how should these companies continue uh, home office? Should they invest in remote work once the pandemic is over? Um, Judith, would you like to take that question? I think it's very hard to answer that um, uh, for, for all of the small and medium-sized companies out there, because I think that we're all work 
in very different industries. Um, and I'm sure there are a number of small mid-sized out there for whom there's a very easy business case to give their people iPads or laptops. Um, because, you know, the good thing is these things don't cost an arm and a leg anymore. But but I can't judge, I can't judge for, for, for the different businesses out there. I think it very much depends also what their people tell them and how hot the, the labor market is that they're competing in. Uh, because I do think that people, whilst they, they they didn't like exclusively sitting at home. Many, I think, have gotten uh, the appetite for more autonomy and, uh, and more flexibility. And maybe there is also a way of giving that and being creative um, you know, in, a, in a way that doesn't require big investments in technology. So I think there's, there's also creative ways of getting to greater flexibility and autonomy even without um, big investments to be made. Thank you. Um, another question um, has to do with how do you balance office people and those who cannot work in the office without creating a two levels of employees? Um, Hiltrud, um, would you like to um, answer that um, interesting question? Yeah, I tried to say that before um, to um, to make sure that um, you treat all your employees um, with with the same um, respect. Um, first of all, you have to be trustworthy that uh, their health and safety is absolutely in the center, and uh, that the communication needs to be honest and transparent, um, and needs to be regular. Um, and um, so this constant dialogue with all employees has shown that it makes feel people more safe, uh, even if they have to come to the office every day. And uh, our 100 point plan, which I mentioned earlier, um, did not start at uh, the place of work. Uh, it covered also the way from home into the office, uh, how to commute, um, how to enter the premises, uh, the plant. Uh, so, so the whole bunch um, of, of different situations that could, your, uh, that could put your um, health at risk, uh, they were covered, uh, there was help uh, given. And um, yeah, that, that is important because we will have uh, uh, this, um, yeah, situation as long as we are an industrial um, country and not only a country with uh, service industry. Thank you very much. Um, the next question uh, comes from uh, for Molly. And the question has to do with how do you teach, integrate, and develop new staff? Um, that's a, okay, that's a great question. So onboarding is such a critical um, part of, you know, of, of your work life. It's, it's one of those moments that matter as we call it. So we put a lot of effort into onboarding um, and that's everything from relationship building and, and helping people understand who their stakeholders are um, and setting up those meetings to just, you know, knowing the business and understanding um, how the company makes money, right? Like the make, move, sell process pro um, process for all of our food and beverages. So we do a combination of, um, you know, meetings and, uh, and formal learning, right? So there's learning pathways that we have set up for onboarding, um, and then making sure people are, are starting and nurturing the relationships that really matter. Um, for the folks that have, who have onboarded to the company during the pandemic and have never set foot in an office where, um, we have a plan to re-onboard them as offices reopen and sort of do like a class of 2020 or a class of 2021 where we're making them feel special and integrated and not just assuming that they can show up at the office and um, hit the ground running because, you know, they've been working over Zoom with everyone up to this point. So um, I think it's just, it's, it's part information sharing, um, part inclusion and belonging, and then just, uh, you know, business knowledge and, and understanding stakeholders. So it's we try to personalize it as much as we can while making sure the experience is great for everyone. Perfect, thank you. Um, another question um, is about leadership. Uh, what did we learn about leadership that's here to stay? Uh, Andrea? 
I am. When, it's a, it's a, it's a, I, I like the question because it challenges the employers as such, right? And perhaps first of all, kudos to all HR colleagues who did a, did a tremendous job there. Um, leading virtual teams, to me, um, that means encouraging each other to learn, to adapt, to, to speak up, to better listen, and to proactively ask where help and support is needed, and to motivate others to, to do the same. You know, our workplace should be a home away from home, or our colleagues should be like a second family, so that we're creating an environment which allows us to make mistakes and then to encourage us to move forward, to excel. I mean, that's the only way that we can conquer the future together as one. Great, thank you. And we have another question of how do you protect the people who are pushing for transformation? Um, as they are questioning the status quo, and that could be taken personally from the management. Um, who would like to uh, answer that question? Well, I can start if you want. Um, I mean, uh, we are talking about uh, the VUCA world, uh, and we were talking about it even before the pandemic. So ba basically, uh, the transformation is something we will not uh, hold up, even if we are uh, reluctant to accept um, that that we are living in uh, a highly disruptive world. Um, I. I believe the same is true as uh, was in the crisis management, that the more trust you earn from your employees, uh, the more transparent you are about what to expect, the more tools you provide, especially on those that are in the center of transformation that have to change jobs, I, I think the easier it will be. And, um, I mean, especially those uh, that that are now in their 40s or 50s and 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 fear that their place of work will disappear in, in five or 10 years, uh, so long before retirement, we have to give them answers. Yeah. So um, that's why that's why lifelong learning uh, is so important. That's why uh, it is important that every employee also has a right to know uh, what is the future of my workplace is there is there an end date uh, to uh, to the jobs that i'm doing and uh, the more transparency there is and and the more we work also with the workers council to identify those transformational issues uh, the easier it will be to handle Thank you for, yes, Andrea, you would like I, I, to I add. just like to add, we, we should be seeing transformation as a chance, not a threat, right? And depending on the speed, if it is too fast for some, we have to slow down, right? Um, but it's a chance, it's a great opportunity. And, and at the end, everybody likes to grow and achieve more. I've not seen a single person who is not proud and happy if they've achieved something. So it's a great opportunity to achieve the future. Thank you very, very much. And on this positive note, I would also like to thank you, uh, you the panelists for your time and valuable insights. Thank you to the audience as well for their great questions. And it is now my pleasure to pass over to Monica Jones uh, of Deutsche Welle, uh, who will be moderating the next panel, uh, Decisions and Analytics in the Digital Age. Uh, thank you so much again.